So um, this is where we're at. So Mark, um, I'll let you uh, get us started. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, introductions. Thank you, Lisa. Well, welcome everybody to the presentation. I hope you can hear me okay. Uh, my name is Mark Cooper. I'm one of the co-presenters and I am a instructional technologist at Idaho State University. I've been an instructional technologist there since 2017 and I have an overall experience in that field of 15 years, mostly in corporate instructional design. Uh, recently, I've become a co-coordinator for ISU uh, for QM um, and I am also a, a peer reviewer and in my spare time I love to cook and I was born in Pittsburgh and I'm a I'm a big fan of the Pittsburgh Steelers. Thanks, well, thanks Mark. Um, I'm the Quality Plus program manager. I'm also an, uh, another uh, coordinator for QM. Um, I have an experience in K-12 and higher ed and adult ed and a what and science and French and computers. Um, so Mark has a, a nice balance to some of my background. I've been involved with QM since 2011 and for something fun, um, I love tacos. So let's hear a little bit. Uh, let's see, I told you about the handouts. Um, these slides will be in, in the link and there is a Google Doc. Please note it's an ongoing project. So um, we have a lot more ideas that we're going to be putting in there. Um, it has details, it has examples, um, it has grading rubrics, things like that to help you. So now tell us about your role. So in the Pear Deck, you should be able to drag that star. Um, I know that we all have lots of uh, uh, roles. So grab that star and put it on. Let's see, let me share those results as you're going. Wow. So it looks like we have, um, the majority seems to be between that teaching and that instructional design. Um, so thank you. Looks like people are having fun trying yeah. to decide what they do. Um, sure. I will say that with this, uh, this panic, um, more of my family now understand what I do because I've been doing Zoom training for all of them. <laughs> um, so I think that has been great. All right, I'm gonna lock those answers and uh, we're gonna do another one here. And so how would you describe online discussions? You should be able to use text or you can even draw if you want to uh, test your uh, mouse writing skills and I'm gonna share these. Used and abused, wow. Can be boring, forced. Boring even when I add video. Great if I reinforce what I want, excellent. Depends on the faculty, true. An engaging conversation from both students and instructors. I like the opportunity. It's, it is yes. an opportunity to uh, kind of go there. All right. So much potential. <laughs> I like that one. We're hoping to get more potential. <laughs> All right, I'm going to lock the screens here and uh, stop sharing that. So um, based on your comments, it sounds like a lot of your discussions kind of sound like this. I like bread. I agree. I love bread too. I like the part that you said you like bread. Great point. Or perhaps. Two plus two equals four. Wow, I totally agree. I like how you added those twos together and got four. Very insightful. <laughs> I hope that gave you a laugh. And uh, yes, a lot of our discussions are <laughs> like that. Um, forced, a lot of what you said, generic, boring. Um, and uh, 
So before we go into this, you know, breaking the humdrum of the post once and reply to, that's a common, common um, instructions. And so thinking about that, um, why do we have these instructions? And you have to really think about that why in order to figure out how to solve some of that boringness, that generic, the, the forced. Um, and initially, I think it was a, a way to prime the pump. You wanted to try and get the discussion going, just like you have in the live class. Um, you get, you know, those two or three students that you have that you can then call on them and then suddenly everybody jumps in. And that's kind of what we're trying to do. It's how to get engagement. Um, somebody in the, with the answers talked about that's how you check for attendance. Um, and uh, the nice thing about this is the interaction requirements are clear. A nice connection to QM 5.4. Um, it's also expected. So as we've come more into online, it's kind of expected. You post one, you reply to two others. Okay, I get that. It's get that drill. Um, in talking uh, with faculty and others about discussions, um, we would argue that online discussions are formative assessment. Um, and I think that's important for, for this, is that um, they can be graded. This is Lisa opinion. You can grade formative assessment. That's a way of feedback. Um, but they're not really summative assessments. Um, this is the one area in online where we've kind of pushed this rigor up and it's not equivalent to face-to-face. -to -face. It's more. We ask more of our students in these online discussions than we would ever ask in our face-to-face -face classes. So really thinking about what we want to get out of that and making sure that we're right, using the right tool for the job. Okay, we're gonna talk a little bit about three areas and how to troubleshoot a bad discussion. And in my job uh, as an instructional designer working with faculty, I have encounters with instructors and I've had encounters with other course designers through these uh, uh, the Quality Matters conferences who have um, negative perceptions about discussions. And many of, many of those came out as we were doing our poll a few moments ago. Uh, and this is based on just some past online experience. So what can be done with discussions in order to make them a little bit better? And what, when I'm working with, with instructors, um, there are a number of different ways um, that we can troubleshoot either on the delivery or on the design when, um, when online discussions just don't go well. So um, in this presentation, we'll mainly focus on how to design better discussions. There's a whole other, um, there could be a whole other discussion on how to deliver them as well. Um, so first uh, thing I like to troubleshoot is looking at the prompt. Um, and, um, you know, does it have a single answer? Does the question leave room for interpretation? Um, is the question written so that, you know, learners who come in late to the discussion um, and, and they get frustrated because all the good answers have been taken? Um, and so this really defeats the purpose of using an online discussion in a collaborative way. Um, you also wanna consider open-ended questions. Um, as your question prompt, because those could be answered in many different ways. And um, posing questions that actually pose a question in the form of a problem statement. So an example of that could look like, uh, this is very um, on topic in, in with uh, what we're going through, remote workers across the, com the country uh, should be able to communicate with one another seamlessly and effortlessly without getting bogged down with unnecessary messages. So what are some of the best tools that teams can use to communicate seamlessly and effortlessly and why? So that could be a good example of a question that poses a question in the form of a problem statement. Another thing I like to look at is then is to take a look at the instructions and are your instructions clear um, for the posting guidelines um, do they communicate what the learners need to do and, and do they set the instructor's expectations? And with the replies, um, do, uh, are there clear expectations on how learners should reply? So often when um, learners are new to online uh, learning and online courses, they don't know how to reply. So you get a lot of those, I like bread and two plus two 
um, are the prompts and you get a lot of good point, I agree. And these are responses and postings that just don't have a lot of substance. So um, show them what good looks like in, in your replies. And um, you do that with the expectations and provide them a structure um, such as the RISE model. Um, if you've ever heard of the, the RISE model. Um, set rules for netiquette is my last, um, or in that category, my last uh, point is um, have rules for netiquette. Um, do you have students, do you have learners who um, like to dominate the conversation without letting others speak? So try to minimize those conversation dominators um, and put those, those in your instructions. Um, also, do you have rules on being respectful in online discussions? So a good netiquette statement, whether that is in the instructions or in a syllabus, is a, is a great way to set that. And the last one is here is grading. Um, and so make sure that your grading reflects what you want to get out of it. So meaning if you have a discussion that you're considering a formative assessment, weigh it as such and with higher points or a higher percentage. Um, or if you have a discussion that's optional and not really used as an assessment, then you should lower the percentage points. So make sure that, that your grade aligns with what you're hoping to get out of it. And don't make your grading too difficult. If you need a rubric um, for an evaluation um, or you know, ask yourself, do you need a rubric or is a simple grading guide with a scale um, would that do the trick? And then lastly, and most, uh, most applicable to what we're here today for, is um, provide specific and descriptive evaluation criteria. And that aligns with Quality Matters Standard 3.3. So let your le learners know how they're being graded in the forum um, or um, in the section, in the grading section of your syllabus. So let them know up front how they're going to be graded. All right, so hopefully we've kind of laid some background and this is kind of the meat of where we're going to go. So um, how to make discussion, alternative discussion types. Um, so with each of these discussions, what we've done is we've kind of broken them down and tried to provide uh, four different areas. So um, this is what you'll find. Most of the details of this will be in that Google Doc that's linked in our handouts. Starting with the example, um, there's a section on that shows an example or a description of things like prompts or instructions, possibly grading. Um, there's going to be a rationale. So why you would want to use this? Um, when would this be good? Um, this is a good time to think about what your outcomes are. Like Mark said, making sure that uh, what you want to get out of the discussion matches with your course outcomes or why it would be good, good in, in what kind of context. And then we also have a, a section on when it works. So this is the, the type of outcomes that um, you're hoping to get out of your discussion prompt. And we also did our very, uh, uh, our very best to kind of tag some examples of where this type of discussion might work best with a particular academic discipline. And you see there's a very fine line between rationale and when it works. So kind of the how and the why. And lastly, we did some connections um, to QM specific review standards. A lot of them you'll see are the same. And then the UDL guidelines. Um, one of the, my aspects has been uh, an accessibility advocate. And so really looking at universal design for learning. And I've just used numbers in there. Um, there's a link to the full uh, UDL guidelines um, in the handouts which will be on the QM website connected with the conference uh, materials. And uh, we just put the numbers in there um, so you can look them up, but uh, they'll be there. So, so here's an example of uh, one of our first uh, options. Okay. And this is the reflection, or you might know this as a reflection journal. And it's a type of uh, activity where it gives uh, the learners an opportunity to reflect on what they've learned. And uh, you can either do this in uh, an individual or personal way uh, where it's just set up as their own, their own space for reflection. So the learners and the instructors are the only ones that would actually uh, be able to see and comment. 
um, you can set it up in small groups or you can set it up um, for the whole class. And we do this in a course that we teach at ISU um, called Teaching Online with Moodle, which is um, a course that we teach faculty. And uh, we have a, you know, an activity where throughout the course, um, the participants can reflect on what they've learned. But also at the end of the course, there is a, um, a much larger um, post, day, post at the end where learners can reflect on what they've learned throughout the course. Or you could do that midpoint. And um, here is an example. Um, so uh, with the daily or weekly reflections, you could do something like, tell me three of the most significant things you learned this week and what were two things that confused you? And what is your plan to apply one thing that you've learned to economics? Um, and then um, in the midpoint or the end of the course, uh, compare the past 16 weeks. So what were some assumptions that I had at the beginning of the course that have changed or are different or have been challenged now that I've completed the course? And what's one of the most important things that I've learned about myself during this whole journey? And then the rationale for a reflection is reflection is just a great opportunity for learners to uh, employ some of those metacognitive uh, strategies for diagnostic reasoning to be able to do decision making um, in their own learning and critical analysis and self examination. So it's just a way of um, just developing that reflective thinking, which is such an important component to uh, learning. And finally, when it works well, is um, anytime you need, you want your learners to be able to um, think about how they're going to apply this knowledge that they've gained um, either in the week or in the course. And really this uh, discussion type would work well in just about any academic discipline. And here are some of our connections to uh, Quality Matters standards and UDL standards for this particular discussion type. And I believe we had a couple questions. So um, we're gonna to go to just a, a quick uh, reading of our uh, Q&A. I'd say most of them have to do with the handout and I realize I apologize what happened is we did the finishing touches on the handout. We shared a link to the folder, um, but it didn't get moved in. So as oh, soon okay. as we are done, we will look, that link should take you to a Google folder that will have both of these in there. So I apologize for that. Um, they will be there. <laughs> Thank you, everyone. That's what most of those are about. <laughs> <laughs> we did have a question, Lisa. I think it was a little bit further up, um, and it was regarding the maximum number um, of people who are in a discussion post. I wish I could find that again. I'd say it depends. I hate that answer, but it is. It so depends on... Uh, on what it is you want to accomplish. Um, and uh, as we go through some of these, we actually do talk about breaking into small jerk. We just did reflection. Reflection could be done as a whole class. It could be done in small groups and it could be done individually. It will just depend on what you want to accomplish with that. Um, when the, with the weekly three, two, one, uh, I've done that, we've done that individually. So it's just kind of a one-on-one -on -one so people can feel comfortable expressing their confusion. Um, but the overall um, end of class, that reflection we have done um, openly um, so everybody can see it. And some of those quotes are even used uh, uh, for being collected and kind of as testimonials and advice for others. Right. I did see a question that came through asking what the RISE model is. Uh, the RISE model, if you just Google RISE model, um, it's by Emily Ray. So I'm typing that in. Um, it is a great uh, way to <laughs> guidelines for, for feedback. Um, it is linked in the Google Doc that will be in the handouts. Yes. So um, the other question that we have in the Q&A is our teaching online with Moodle class. Um, did we develop this? Um, yes, we did. We've been developing it since uh, 2014. Um, 
uh, this is feel free to reach out to me. I'd be happy to share and talk more about that. Um, I'm also doing a presentation later. Um, not going to talk mostly about that, but talking about uh, the implementation of our Quality Plus program, and that course is one of that. And in terms of data on this next question, um, I'm actually, let's see, I'm going to read that one, and I'm going to move because this is a Pear Deck. All right. So you guys are going to select which ones we go to next. So I'm going to let you guys do that. So go ahead and choose an option while I answer. Uh, do you have any data that a general threaded discussion in which all students reply to one discussion tree is better than the discussion option in which each student posts an individual response and on separate response? We don't have any data in terms of that. And if you notice, we're focusing on the why. Why do you want to have a discussion? And that connects back to your course outcomes. Um, what is it that you want to accomplish with the discussion? How is it going to help your students meet the outcomes? All of that. So really think a lot of it comes to that, and that's the way we're focusing um, on these. So there is a total of 15. Make sure you scroll all the way down. Mm -hmm. um, got about half responses. Wow. So. So far, it looks like case study is in the lead. That's a popular one. Yep. All right. Challenge questions is coming up. It's mm -hmm. still open, so you can affect things. I know you only get one choice. Um, that has to do with the Pear Deck. So let's see. So eight and five. Any more responses coming in? We have student showcase. See, I think there was another four up. Oh, there's another five student facilitation. That moves up. It's like a, it's like a race. It's like a, it a horse is. race. <laughs> 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 All right. If you haven't figured out how to how to post, you can throw it in the chat. I am actually watching that chat, so I can add a, a number there to you. All right, student facilitation. I'm actually glad you're picking that one. Um, debate is coming in. Oh, okay, to debate. Student showcase, yeah, debate went ahead of student showcase. Come on, debate. <laughs> <laughs> I feel bad. The funny thing is we've divided these up and you guys are picking all of Mark's. <laughs> so <laughs> you're gonna hear a lot of Mark. <laughs> All right, I think we're going to move on so that we can get through. Uh, we're going to try and get through three of these. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to lock those responses, take a note, and I'm going to have to change. All right. Pear Deck did not work nicely with our Google Slides. <laughs> oh, okay. So I'm moving back. I might be able to talk a little bit about challenge questions with case studies. All right, so um, case study was our number one. So Mark, take it away. All right, so case study, as, as you're familiar with, is basically it's a real life case uh, where the learners are, are posed, um, they read uh, the case, they, they're posed a question. Um, case studies could be done either individually or in small groups and can be brainstormed to share the workload. So um, I have a really, um, really cool example um, in the guide that you have, but I kind of um, pared it down here a little bit. So in this case, this is a, a case study for a social, work, uh, social worker um, course, a social work course. And um, so it, it says here, carefully read the, the social work case study, answer the questions in the discussion forum, refer to the um, social work policy and legal framework as your body of work to reference. 
And so um, there's, uh, I adapted this from, I, I found, in, and there's um, it's linked in the references, this comes from uh, Scotland, the University of Edinburgh, and where they do this case study. And so then the, 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 excuse me, the discussion questions ask, what are you thinking? What are you worried about? When, it, when after reading through this, this case, uh, what was the first thing that you're gonna say or do uh, in this situation? And how would you ensure that Vicki, that's the person who's the case study on, is kept safe and still respect her wishes and feelings? Um, where and from whom could you seek help and what next? So these are just great um, ways to, to be able to apply uh, what you've learned to a realistic case. And so the major advantage with a case study is being able to do problem solving with what you've learned and um, apply some analytical skills, decision making, and just being able to cope with ambiguities and, and being flexible uh, in your learning as you're put on the spot. And case studies work really well in situations where there are real world situations and where learners can apply their learning. And I have a couple examples of um, law, business, economics, this would work great in a medical field. Um, I, I did uh, uh, you know, an example earlier about social work, engineering, education, and these are just to name a few. And just to kind of tag onto that, because I know um, challenge questions was another one that was in there. Challenge questions are basically mini case studies. And I got this idea well, uh, from Quality Matters when I was taking the course review manager uh, QM course, as there's an activity in there where we learn how to become a QM course manager, and then the instructor posed some really um, short, um, what would you do in this situation kind of questions, and we had to go back through our reading and apply what we learned. And here are our connections to uh, Quality Matters standards for this, as well as uh, the UDL uh, standards. And then finally, we can open it up for some questions about case studies. All right, I'm opening them up. Uh, one question, can a multiple response question be used in Pear Deck? No, unfortunately, uh, Greg, it cannot. <laughs> Um, uh, the other one, uh, can, why did I choose Pear Deck? Um, I chose Pear Deck because, uh, one, it's a tool that I've been wanting to use. Um, and so <laughs> this is a great opportunity to use it. And, um, it was also a good opportunity because with everything going on, I was able to get access to the premium, um, to actually play a little bit more with it. So looks like there might be a, a couple of questions that are in the chat at the moment. I don't have the chat window open, so um, if you want to put those in there. Uh, to answer some of the previous questions with case study and challenge, uh, the case study would work really nice in a small group and then have the small group present out. So breaking that down into a small group of maybe three to five to work through the case study individually. Um, that could be done asynchronously in a discussion or it could be done through live meeting together group work and then have each group report out on the results of theirs and then do some compare and contrast which also ties into the um, small group share out which is very much like a think pair share um, but the challenge questions that uh, the example we use there is actually from the QM uh, reviewer course is done as a whole group um, which works really nicely because everybody gets to kind of see how they would answer it in those contexts. So to that question about size and numbers, um, it kind of depends on what you want to accomplish. Lisa, All real right. quickly, we do have one in the chat about um, uh, being unable to access the handouts. Could we just real quickly um, just uh, give some information about that? So. You have a link at link is up there. We will move these in as soon as this is done. So um, that I've made a note to myself to move uh, the final products that we are going to share. Uh, that was the last thing that did not happen. Thank you. The, the rest were just basic connectivity issues. 
And I will say that at this point, uh, we are, uh, that, that was the last pair deck, so we're not doing any more pair deck after this. <laughs> um, so go ahead and you'll put all of your questions in that Q&A. Um, here's a good question for you, Mark. Um, what is the role of the instructor in the case study discussion? That's a very good question. The, the role of the instructor in a case study, um, it could be a number of things. Um, overall, I think it's just the facilitator of it. So the instructor would pose the prompting question um, to, the, to the case. Um, and then monitor the discussion. So based on if the discussion is going well, they might step back and just let the discussion happen. Or um, if, if the discussion is you know, struggling or if it's getting flat, they might jump in and interject with maybe um, their own personal experience or um, you know, a little bit of a, you know, kind of a booster to help the conversation get started. I kind of see the instructor overall just being the facilitator of the whole thing. And another question that came in is, there's lots of questions on those case studies. Mm -hmm. And um, you're not really I'm kind of asking and answering this too. Um, you're not really asking the students to provide an answer to all of that. You want them to discuss those questions in a small group. Um, I've done a case study where we did the small group case study in the discussion as a small group and then we had a live session follow up and in the live session each group basically had to present what was their next step so that very last question and then the other groups and myself as the the instructor in that case um, challenged and asked questions and why they came to that conclusion um, and one of the case studies I did, um, I became very um, <laughs> antagonistic and had to keep telling the students, I'm just presenting an alternate side. You have to think <laughs> of all the sides. <laughs> so, um, and in that case, we used asynchronous to start and then we used synchronous to have the small groups present out. But really the ultimate is, what is your next step and why is what you're wanting the students to report out on, but you use the case study questions to help guide them through that thinking. I'm just going to pause here for a time check. We have about 14 and a half minutes. Yeah. So I'm going to quickly, so Mark kind of did the challenge questions. I am going to do the student facilitation. And the reason I am doing the student facilitation, um, it seems pretty obvious, but the example we have here is from a math class. And so um, in terms of a discussion, what do you discuss in math? And um, this isn't really about a discussion. It's about using the discussion tool to help students work through the problems. So what happens is uh, the students at the beginning of the course, they select a week where they're going to be a facilitator of a problem set. And they submit their solutions to all of the problem sets to the instructor ahead of time. And the instructor gives them feedback. And then all the other students during that week post their solutions and the student facilitator provides feedback. Um, the way this is graded, it's participation. This is basic homework in math, but it's getting that feedback. So it ties into that um, oh, 3.5, I believe it is, where students are able to track their progress. So here is an example of how this might look. So you'll notice that our pirate here is posting answers and our Viking here on the left is providing uh, feedback uh, for um, those answers. Um, so this is graded on participation. Uh, the way this instructor does it is you have to participate as a facilitator and you have to re participate in 80% of the other discussions. Um, so kind of along that QM, 85%. Um, so it's not that post once and reply to two others, it's providing that, that guideline. Um, anytime where you have, uh, you want to do some peer review or you have problem sets, want students to practice with the material, um, the instructor does model facilitation for the first week uh, while the other students get on board, um, but it's a very different way to use the discussion tool to complete homework assignments that you have to practice with. So chemistry, stats, computer science, engineering, physics. Um, it's about using the tool to accomplish what you want to have done in the course. So um, here are some of our standards connections. And um, again, this student facilitation can also be used in other 
areas, you could modify it a little bit. Maybe have the students post questions and they post questions to the instructor. So I'm going to do some Q&A here. I will say um, Nancy has about a two minute difference um, at the 14 minute or maybe four minutes. She said at the 14 minute she had 10. <laughs> so, <laughs> so we must have hit our, our time a little bit later. Okay. <laughs> so um, time is really limited. Um, and that is a concern, Maria. Um, and so you don't have to do a discussion every week. Um, that's the other thing. Discussion is a tool. It's a tool that you can use. Make sure you're using the right tool for the job. Um, discussions, as was mentioned, are overused because it was one of the first tools that came out. Um, but think about using the tool differently. Um, hopefully I answered that. Um, Again, with our student facilitation, they need to be doing their homework anyways. All right, Mark, do you see any uh, questions in the chat? Uh, let's see. Uh, here's well, another one that um, came in. Yeah. Sorry. From Natasha? Yeah, about 80%. They have to participate in 80% of the forums. So 80% of the problem sets. And then we have from Mark Johnston, um, can you suggest strategies for building self-sustaining discussions? That is a good question. Um, I think a lot of it has to do with um, connecting to, to real life. Um, so making sure that um, you can connect a, we did the mixing up the introductions and I have to say in one of these classes it was a cohort of nursing and I came in as a I was teaching them how to teach online and um, the question I asked them was what did you do over the summer and it turned out that um, of the 14 in the class eight of us had gone to the Spencer Opal Mines which is just about uh, three hours two hours north of us here in Pocatello and so suddenly we connected about the opal mines. And so finding ways to get people to connect is how you get that self-sustaining would be my, my suggestion. Mark, do you have any other ideas? Um, sorry, I don't have any specific concrete ideas there. And Maria asked the question, um, QM, I believe, does not require a, a discussion every week. Um, there are some other organizations that do, I know that, but my interpretation of the QM rubric is that you need to look for student engagement and learner-learner mm -hmm. interaction if it's appropriate in the course. Um, peer review wake, works as a great learner-learner interaction. Um, And in terms of faculty participating, I will again say it comes down to what you want to get out of the discussion. Exactly. Mm -hmm. um, another uh, tool that we've used is um, from Pratt and Prolo, talking about how teachers are active at the beginning but slowly phase out. So designing your um, forums so that you can support the students in becoming good online participants and then slowly phase out so that they become self-regulated, self-motivated learners. Right. I will mention to the group that I put those resources in the, the discussion folder, um, both the uh, presentation and the uh, alternative discussion structures. So those should be available. Thank you, Mark. Another example of student facilitation, um, I would have um, I would have a student propose t take a week and they would either select an article, they would select uh, some questions that they would then guide through um, the other students. So in other words, they become the teacher of that week. Um, I have a nurse, uh, she's in the DMP, Doctorate of Nurse Practitioner, and the students actually find an article and they lead a, an article discussion um, 
uh, as part of that. So they read and uh, meet with the instructor ahead of time to kind of go over the article in depth. So you get that one-on-one -on -one nice learner instructor interaction and feedback. And then the week comes and, and that student then leads. Again, that's a doctoral student as well. Um, you're going to have higher levels of that, but I can tell you that stats class, um, that was entry level, that was an 1100 level class that they do the problem sets in. Um, in terms of how often do the students facilitate, you have to figure out uh, what works best for your content. Um, in that math class, um, every student had to pick a week. Um, that class happens to pick, uh, sometimes weeks have two or three problem sets, so they actually pick problem sets. Um, so, um, and sometimes the instructor will split it up depending on the number of students, but that class they actually keep it a, a smaller size class. Um, in the nurse practitioner one, um, that's a small class as well. And so they usually have a class of eight. So it's every other week on that one. The student facilitates one of those. All right. I think that's all the Q&As there. I'm going to come back here. I think we are coming to a close. So we'll just continue with here's our contact information and any other questions that you have. There's a lot more discussion types in here. Mm -hmm. And um, there's more details on the Google Doc that uh, Mark has moved into the folder. So you should be able to uh, find those. And Marissa Lotta, you say you're still having difficulties. So uh, we'll follow up with that to make sure that they are there. Mark, Lisa, thank you so much for uh, presenting today. We really appreciate it. And thank you for stepping up when I had some technical difficulties here and jumping in and taking over. And uh, thanks everyone for your patience with that. Um, I just want to remind everyone to please complete the session survey. And I have posted the link for that in the chat there. Um, again, we appreciate you coming and we'll look forward to seeing you all in the next session. Thank you, Nancy, and thank you everyone. Yeah, thank you. Great questions. Great questions.